It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dan Reed, one of the editors from InterVarsity Press, and uh, he'll be our host for the afternoon session. Dan. I'm Dan Reed with InterVarsity Press, and um, that gives me the right to give a book plug. <laughs> they are fairly giving away a book out and back there called The Global Dictionary of Theology. I was just looking at it, I was amazed. 60% off a $50 book for 20 bucks. Now, I worked on that project for several years, and I want to tell you that's worth more than $20, so you need to go and grab one. <laughs> Well, this afternoon and this evening, our discussion takes a Latin American turn. And if you, having returned from lunch, are thinking this gives you the opportunity to indulge in some contextualized theology of Latin America siesta, <laughs> our speakers have accepted the challenge of overturning that notion. Our first speaker, he is on home turf here. Professor Gene Green is professor of New Testament at Wheaton College. He earned his PhD in New Testament at the University of Aberdeen and served as a missionary in Latin America for 13 years in the Dominican Republic in Costa Rica. And he has also published a number of works in New Testament, both in English and in Spanish, including commentaries in both languages on First and Second Thessalonians and Jude and Second Peter. So let's welcome this afternoon our first speaker, Professor Gene Green. I feel like my job this afternoon is uh, standing here as a bridge between our brothers and sisters from the majority world and minority communities and the rest of us who have been uh, raised in an area where European theology has been the norm. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, pardon and forgiveness if I misrepresent anybody here from the majority world and your hermeneutics and I'd like to ask patience uh, from everyone else as well. A number of years back, Samuel Escobar and I were together on the literature committee of John Stott Ministries. We were talking before one of our meetings, and he turned to me and said, all theology is contextual. So the name of this paper, the hermeneutical challenge of contextual theologies, could be misleading. Our contextual theologies, those which come from the majority world and minority groups in North America, or are all theologies contextual by their very nature? In other words, do we in North America have an accent, or is it just them in Latin America and Africa who have accents and who display this deep interplay between their understanding and expression of their faith and their cultural and social location? I agree with Samuel that all theology is indeed contextual, even Western theology. In a 2009 address at Elmhurst College, Gustavo Gutierrez said something similar to Samuel's remark. For some time, he noted professors of theology in Latin America, Asia, and Africa were teaching European theology. But then they began to do theology from their own place, with their own perspectives. He said, some people call these new theologies contextual theologies. He continued, this is all very funny, you know, because does this mean that European theology is not contextual? It's very curious. Many global and minority biblical scholars and theologians have begun to question whether Western theology is acontextual and therefore universal. The late Kwame Beriako observed that one of the profoundest criticisms of Western theology made by the theologians of the South, that Western theology was for so long presented in all its particulars as the theology of the church, when in fact it was geographically localized and culturally limited, European and Western, and not universal. So this paper is about the hermeneutical developments in African, Asian, Latin American, African American, Latino, Asian American, and Native North American or First Nations communities. We'll be here till six o'clock tonight. <laughs> Although I will mainly interact with interpreters in the majority world. 
As we become aware of the hermeneutical and theological trends in these circles, we also discover that we of European descent who live in, North, in the North Atlantic region have expressed the faith in concert with our cultures as well. We are contextual in our approach to the faith, conditioned by our history. We have an accent. And when we travel, that's the moment that we learn what our culture is about and what our accent is. A number of years ago, I was sitting in my office at the Seminario Sepa in San Jose, Costa Rica, and there was a knock on the door. I called out, Pase, and the door opened. A man of modest means and humble dress walked in with a smile and has extended his hand to shake mine as I rose from my desk. He grasped my hand and addressed me, Patron, como esta? The greeting left me speechless, and the moment stretched and warped as I tried to get my mind around this greeting, patron. You see, I was a middle-class, middle-aged man from the suburbs of Chicago. Nobody had ever greeted me as patron. Sure, I knew about patronage and Chicago city politics and my limited... <laughs> understanding of what it meant to be a patron braced me for what was coming next. He wanted something from me. I was the rector of the seminary, a North American who drove a car, rusted as it was, and I was seated in our institution's central office. Patron! In this man's eyes, I was the person with power and money. He understood my position from his place and believed that I could make something happen for him. In that brief exchange, I was thrust into another place as a door swung open to a whole social matrix in Latin America. From that moment onward, I began to see things differently. Patronage, power, and protection on the one side with need, dependency, and demonstrations of honor on the other. Understanding dawned about how patronage worked in Costa Rica and what my place was within that system as a North American from the richest and most powerful nation on earth. I was just a poor missionary. I have the old 1040s to prove it. <laughs> but in that context, I was viewed as a person who had power and access. I could make it happen. Patron. Something very strange occurred after that encounter. As I read my New Testament from that place, I began to recognize that the issues of patronage were threaded through the pages of our text. Patronage, as Wallace Hadrill and others have reminded us, was part of the warp and woof of Roman society. Clientela, as it was called, made the world go round and formed the structures for political, economic, social, and religious relationships. The New Testament developed on that contextual playing field and adopted and adapted not only the language of patronage, but also worked at its theology with reference to that central social reality. And right now I feel like I'm channeling Andrew Walls. Peter identified Jesus as a person, as a patron rather, in Acts 10.38. And in his first letter, he encouraged the believers to do good in society. Language taken directly from the uh, inscriptions of the time, which celebrated the acts of patrons, those who did good. Some of the theological terms of our faith, like grace and faith, at times reflect their use within the conceptual domain of patronage. In reading texts on patronage and looking at the New Testament through Greco-Roman cultural lenses, my vision then turned back to Latin America, where this dialogue with patronage had begun. The manifestations of patronage in ancient Rome and the church were not identical with those that I encountered in Latin America, but they were similar enough so that my adopted Latin culture allowed me to see the biblical message and the biblical text helped me to make my way through Latin culture as a North American Christian. These events were my dawn of understanding how our situatedness or our social place raises new questions upon reading scripture and how new insights come from examining the biblical text and from, different culture, from a different cultural angle. But the experience of living in Latin America also showed how contextualized my own reading was. I too had been reading from a particular place for decades, one which valued individualism over community, Jesus is my personal savior, progress over patience, and systems over relationships.
As we watch the rise of global and ethnic minority theology, this is the first hermeneutical move we observe. Global theologians and biblical scholars are very aware that the place from which they interpret scripture is not a Western place. The questions which have conditioned Western discourse about the Bible and society are not the same as those which are germane in global communities. A few years back, Craig Blomberg, New Testament scholar at Denver Seminary, surmised that, surmised that asking new questions which are not sourced from Western culture and traditions may be what global biblical interpretation is all about. He suggests that we see the globalization biblical interpretation, quote, as a process either of asking questions of a biblical passage, which are not traditionally asked within a particular interpretive community, or of allowing new answers more supportive of the world's oppressed to emerge from old questions out of a more careful exegesis of the text itself. In other words, he suggested that we read with others from elsewhere, those unlike ourselves. Curious enough, he never quoted anybody from the majority world in that article. Blomberg was right up to a point, however, that majority world biblical scholars and theologians have found that Western education literature have not tackled the pressing questions surrounding them, those who interpret uh, in contexts where the oppression of the poor and women are dominant features of the landscape. Asian Christians ask questions about faith in a pluralist culture, while African theologians have grappled with the relationship between Christianity and African traditional religions. Palestinian and First Nations theologians have come to scripture with concerns about the land. In discussing liberation theology, René Padilla said some years ago, my question is not, how do I respond to liberation theology in order to de demonstrate its faults and inconsistencies? Rather it is, how do I articulate my faith in the same context of poverty, repression, and injustice from which liberation theology has emerged? Both the Latin American Theological Fraternity, which Padilla and Escobar uh, helped establish, and Ruth Padilla is the president of that, uh, she'll be speaking next, and also Gustavo Gutierrez, author of A Theology of Liberation, work from their unique place where the rich held the land and advanced economically over the broken backs of the poor who labor for subsistence wages. In that context, Elsa Tamas from Costa Rica wrote her brief commentary entitled The Scandalous Message of James, Faith Without Works is Dead, in which she reads James from that situation in Latin America and highlights the dominance of the problem of oppression and poverty in that epistle. By way of contrast, a paper on James' theological contribution read at a recent Midwest conference hardly mentioned the central issues of poverty and exploitation. Along similar lines, Old Testament scholar Johanna Catanacho wrote a theology of the land from his perspective as a Palestinian Christian raised at the seventh station of the cross in Jerusalem. He saw how North American interpretation of the theology of the land had contributed to the marginalization and oppression of his people. And as an evangelical Old Testament scholar, he recognized the intersection between uh, interpretation and social location, and set out to examine the teaching, the biblical teaching on Haaretz, the land. He concluded, the biblical data demonstrates that the concept of the borders of Haaretz was fluid since its inception, and that God wanted to reach the ends of the earth. The vision is only possible through Christ, for he alone is the legitimate owner of Haaretz, the land, a place that is not made up of mere dirt, but is a locale where righteousness and justice should prevail. Catanacho asked a new and old question and looked at the biblical evidence through a unique social and political lens. And when he presented his article, uh, what he presented in his article was firmly rooted in scripture, but also challenged perspectives on the land, which had dominated since the time of John Darby, the father of dispensationalism. Global biblical scholars ask old questions and go beyond filling the gaps of our theological understanding. They provide us with fresh and needed revisions and reformation. What we have begun to witness in these engagements is, as Kevin Van Hooser summarized, the turn to context. 
The defining characteristic of global biblical interpretation and theology is the deep commitment to understand the faith from and to a particular social context, always with a self-awareness of the interpreter's place and a celebration of the fact that the faith is eminently translatable into the languages of the world, as Laman Sane has stated. What occurs at the level of Bible translation also happens in the reading of scripture and the development of Christian theology. At this juncture in history, the church in the majority world has become, in the words of Justo Gonzalez, a for-self church, one that is not only self-governing and self-propagating and self-funding, but also self-theologizing. And as a global church engages in self-theologizing, the attention turns to the meaning of the gospel in relation to their context. In discussion, discussing Asian uh, theology, Ken Nanakan and uh, Sumitra wrote about seeking a methodology which, quote, has a sensitivity to the context that will be expressed in attempts to theologize relevantly. The concern arises among some Western interpreters that such approaches may degenerate into contextualism, which issues in relativism and the sliding pluralism. And in some quarters, this has indeed occurred, where reading from this place means subsuming scripture entirely to context. But as we observe what is developing in majority world theologies, the dialogue with context is carried on principally with a high view of scripture. The shift is not in most quarters to a shattered theological pluralism and uncommitted relativism, but rather to reflection which takes seriously the way that God still speaks to us in our place through his word. The fundamental reflex and longing is for an engaged faith, but not for a faith void of content and substance beyond the issue of the moment and useful only for one particular community. This is especially true of evangelical interpretation. Shoki Ko once argued that doing theology from a particular context and historical situation does not mean that we end up with a chameleon theology, but a truly Catholic theology, which finds its pattern in the incarnation. That is, as he says, the Son of God was incarnated within a specific human history and culture through which grace has been made available to all. The reflex here is the one reflected in the declaration of Clave Quattro from the Latin American Theological Fraternity. Allow me to quote, the Bible is divine revelation entrusted to human writings. Its value is unique and irreplaceable for reflection on the purposes of God for Latin America. Its divine character makes it the supreme tribunal for doctrine and conduct. Can I hear an amen? amen. Its human character demands of us the constant rereading and contextualization necessary for the diverse generations of disciples. Can I hear another amen? amen. Me explico, entiendes. God's worth both endures forever and is living and active, penetrating down into the joints and marrow of our life. While holding to the normative role of scripture, majority world interpreters hear its prophetic voice speaking into their world. But there is another dimension to this self-conscious contextuality in the majority world readings. KKO observes that varied readings speak to us, first of all, about the limitations of our present knowledge. We currently have, as he says, eschatological reservation, which reminds us that in the present time our knowledge is partial. Or as he says, complete knowledge of the truth cannot be obtained. But there is hope here as we lean towards the telos amidst our varied cultural engagements and readings. Yo strikes his hopeful note saying, the ambiguities, uncertainties, and uncertainties of our culturally conditioned and religiously relative historicities are partially clarified and expanded through the process of global interpretation. Although we cannot hope to achieve any kind of per perfect global interpretation, we might think of this aim towards cross-cultural and global as the eschatological impulse of hermeneutics. Now, Yo's vision that we read together as a community towards a complete understanding of our faith in anticipation of that time of full revelation when we shall know fully 
even as we are fully known. Plurality in reading means that we must gather together as a global community to read and not simply talk among ourselves. Such reading this side of the eschaton requires humility instead of the hubris which regards one's own point of view as the one and only point of view. I had a student, a couple of students in class a few years back. Uh, I asked them, why should we read global theology? They said, well, two of them. And this, they say, said it like this, well, we should read global theology so we know how to correct them. <laughs> OK. But the whole role of context in this discussion about biblical interpretation theology goes beyond seeing things we would not otherwise see, asking questions we would not otherwise ask, and developing theology along lines that we would not otherwise explore. The turn to context has meant the development of approaches to interpretation which locate contextual consideration in a more welcome and central place than they have traditionally occupied in Western reflection. If, on the one hand, Western interpretation has been dominated by the quest for objectivity due to its roots in the Enlightenment, majority world theologians have taken approaches to interpretation which favor intersubjectivity and engagement. The global theological community is not in the main modernist and foundationalist, but acknowledges contextuality to greater or lesser degrees. As John Perrott puts it, what is new in majority world theology is, quote, a uh, dynamic search for self-identity, an identity which takes seriously the traditions and cultures in which it is located, but at the same time seeks to address the social world in which Christians now live. Elsa Tamas, again, takes out a very sharp pencil to draw for us the longing that many experience. She says, when we look for lights to illuminate a miserable present, objectivity is impossible. That miserable present, which many in Latin America and the rest of the majority world experience, is, as she says, like living under a sky without, sky without stars. Absence, with its list of synonyms, lack, privation, omission, estrangement, separation, departure, abandonment, exclusion, withdrawal, desertion, seems to me to be the word to define this reality. The question majority world Christians ask, how do we interpret in these are places which cry for involvement instead of disinterested detachment. One of the first movements in this direction of a self-conscious contextual reading came from liberation theology. A Peruvian priest who lived and worked among the poor in the barrios of Lima penned the seminal expression of this theology, or more properly, these theologies. What Gutierrez saw before him was the eruption of the poor, and he came to understand poverty as institutional violence, which stood alongside the violence of terrorism and repression. Out of that context, he began to define the theological task as critical reflection on praxis in light of the word of God. For him, the first act of theology is liberating engagement with the issues of poverty and oppression, that is, praxis. And then comes critical reflection, which is done in light of the word of God. As he states, theology is reflection, a critical attitude. Theology follows. It is a second step. Or to put it another way, it arises at sundown. And then critical reflection on praxis in light of the word of God informs further praxis and so on. The theological task was not simply to develop a set of abstract propositions as in European theology, but nor is it merely to promote social activism divorced from scripture. One begins with praxis but does not end there. Although theological work is a second stage, it is not secondary for Gutierrez. Now Gutierrez begins not just with any action but with Christian praxis. So the life of the church has oriented the first acts of faith. We have to understand that he writes as a Latin American Catholic and presupposes the church's social presence. But the, dia the important point for us here is to see how deeply tied this theology is with context, a dialogue with a prevailing culture. And indeed, the theological task begins with action oriented towards that context. 
This new way of doing theology was not fully embraced by Latin American evangelical theologians who saw in Gutierrez's framework a subordination of the word of God to, and an absence of evangelical proclamation. But they shared with him a commitment to praxis as an essential component of the theological task. The language used was mission integral, integral mission, which held scripture in the place of primacy, but understood that true theology embraced both praxis and proclamation. They affirmed that the evangelion did not come in word alone, but in word and deed. This theology generated considerable debate at the first Lausanne conference, where René Pavia presented a paper entitled Evangelism and the World, and Samuel Escobar spoke on evangelism and man's search for freedom, justice, and fulfillment. Due to their contribution and the vote of the majority world scholars at that event, we all have the fifth affirmation of the Lausanne Covenant on Christian social responsibility. And with that, they generated a shift in global evangelical theology. Although they located Christian praxis in a different place than had Gutierrez, they understood that one could not do theology from the balcony, but only from the road, as John Mackay had said. Engagement with the social context was not secondary for them, but its location in the theological task was defined along lines other than those developed by Gutierrez. Questions about where we interpret from and where we begin the interpretive process are at the center of the debate. The hermeneutical approaches which map the relationship between the biblical text and social context are therefore varied and at times at variance with each other. It is not all one thing. What may hold true for some Latin American theologians does not hold true for all, and the same may be said for uh, Africans or First Nation theologians. Now, some Westerners who have read only a small subset of majority world theologies have dismissed the whole hermeneutical enterprise because some of the voices they heard pilloried the faith by favoring context at the total expense of scripture. Evangelicals in the majority world share the concern about any approach which subordinates scripture or even dismiss the historic creeds of the church. While contextual considerations provide the framework for undertaking the interpretive task in the majority world, others look to the context as another text to be read, which provides source material for theology. As John Perrot notes, theology also implies a way of looking at the world, bringing to the task something of, one, of one's own historical and cultural experience. This must be done if there is going to be any fusion of the horizon of scripture with the horizon of the interpreters in their context. If the goal of theology is engagement with one's culture, then understanding the complexities of one's own place becomes an essential theological concern. In his discussion of an enculturation hermeneutic, Justin Uckpong attends to the reader in context, that is, the reader who consciously takes his or her socio-cultural context as a point of departure in the reading and who is part and parcel of the Christian community, whose worldview and life experience he or she shares. On this understanding, the context of the reader becomes the subject of interpretation. There is also critical analysis of the interpreter's context, which enables, as he says, him or her to be aware of the influences that work on him or her as he, she, goes about reading the text and to utilize them positively and thus exercise control over them. You've got to know yourself. In this interaction between the ancient text and its context and the interpreter and his or her context, he says, we find meaning. Meaning is not simply about the past. Rather, it is seen as a function of the interaction, he says, of the contemporary context with the text and its context. What we see as emerging, what we see it as emerging within a contemporary context. Now, this is an interpretive move beyond what we have called application here in the West. And it brings us into the swell of tidal forces and hermeneutics in the majority world and in the West as well. On the one hand, we see this situatedness of the interpretive communities and the longing to hear God speaking to them. 
On the other hand, we have concern that reading from a place dissolves all hearing from beyond, as Thistleton says. Reading cannot be a mere projection of self or become no more than self-discovery. And indeed, the vast majority of interpreters affirm the transcendence of revelation in scripture and hold to it dearly. But they simply refuse to accept the supposed cultural detachment which has characterized much of Western reading. They do not view this as God's way of engagement with humanity. They hear God where they are. We should not be surprised, therefore, that in the development of majority world theologies, fresh expressions of the faith have arisen via, via reading the biblical text from within the self-conscious social context. For example, as we'll hear, African theologians have understood Jesus in ways that resonate with traditional concepts which are modified in light of scripture. African views of life turn some to regard Jesus as a life giver, an easy move given John 14:6. The biblical understanding of Jesus as mediator, as in Hebrews, resonates with the African understanding of mediation and the place of ancestors as mediators. Jesus then becomes the ancestor. This enculturation hermeneutic has found wide acceptance so that in India, Jesus may be viewed as a Dalit and in First Nations theology, God is primarily known as creator, resonating with the traditional indigenous concept of God. In an enculturation hermeneutic or translation hermeneutic, we encounter an understanding of God's providence through time and culture, which leads many to see continuity to a greater or lesser degree between established cultural traditions and God's revelation in scripture. Uh, similar to what Paul did in Athens, the adoption and adaptation of cultural traditions is akin to the New Testament use of concepts drawn from the Roman a uh, ruler cult, for example, as the gospel spread through the Mediterranean world. So what we're seeing here is really an old story. A corollary to Up Pong's enculturation hermeneutic is the affirmation that the meaning of a text is not monolithic, but multiplex. The goal is not simply the recovery of history, but the actualization of the theological meaning of the text in the contemporary context. For that reason, the biblical text is seen as plurivalent, that is capable of yielding many different valid meanings depending on the point of departure of reading it. For Akpong, this does not mean that anything goes in interpretation since the text is read as part of the whole of scripture and formulations are constrained by the theology of the Bible. He would not view this as a departure from scripture. All meaning, however, he would argue, is interpreted meaning, because no reader can be co-present with the original communicative event. All reading takes place somewhere and is for somewhere. Now at this point, uh, those of us trained in Western exegetical methodologies may begin to stiffen the spine, furrow the brow, get pen ready uh, to compose a concerned three-part rebuttal. <laughs> But again, what's going on here is not an abandonment of the text or the biblical author, but a recognition that the process of interpretation always involves hermeneutics. However much we may want to make method the king of all hills, meaning is only known and is only useful, if I can echo an American value, if it has efficacy for me, my community, and my world. We're moving here amidst reading communities where the notion of being a disinvolved interpreter is regarded as a quixotic quest which has little hope of true success. The concern with, is with real readers who are not neutral and disinterested, but self-aware. In other words, our identity cannot be bracketed out. The question of identity becomes one of the most dominant considerations and one of the most aggressive interpretive approaches on the contemporary landscape, that being post-colonial biblical interpretation. This hermeneutic takes a serious look at the way the Christian faith came to the majority world in the mouths and hands of those who were members of the colonial powers. The text of the Bible even had a role in the process of colonization as it provided justification for the colonizer's imperial power and became a tool in suppressing the indigenous culture, including religion and language. This even occurred here where we sit when the Bible provided warrant for the ethnic cleansing of this land in the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So 
what's going on in Africa and in India and other places, and here in North America, is a group of theologies that are developing that are dealing with colonial presence and uh, personal and cultural identity. What does biblical interpretation then look like in an era which is throwing off cultural subservience? Enter post-colonial biblical interpretation. Sugatharaja defines the term post-colonial as a resistant discourse which tries to write back and work against colonial assumptions, representations, and ideologies. And what happens here within post-colonial reading is that sometimes there is a recovery of traditions to the extent that you have, in Sugatharaja's view, a reading of the Vedas synoptically with the Gospels. Now, this is not a move that most evangelical interpreters in the majority world would take. But in Africa, for example, in a post-colonial move, there's a concern to take a look again at how God worked within culture and society, in traditions, a recovery of general revelation, and looking at general revelation and what was laid out through culture through the lens of scripture. How do we understand African traditional religions? Is there some spark in the middle of that that shows divine revelation? Some would even use the uh, received text from tradition as a lens through which to view scripture. And then we'll turn again and understand scripture as a final authority. Postcolonialism has many manifestations, but I think it has a real lesson for us here in North America as we attempt to make Western hermeneutics dominant for all communities, which in one ways could be, way could be viewed as an attempt uh, to impose uh, colonialism once again on the hermeneutical enterprise within the majority world. Part of this new hermeneutic uh, within global theology has to do with the participants in the discussion. One of the key things that we hear from global theology is reading from below. Now this has a number of different manifestations. If we take a look at Diane Stinton's book, uh, Jesus of Africa, we hear her not only citing uh, African academic theologians as they work out their Christology, but also taking a look at what is happening among pastors and common Christians as they work out their theology. It's a reading from below. Reading from below also means reading with those who have been on the margins of theological discourse. And as Justo Gonzalez says, if theology is the task of the church, and the church is by definition a community, there should be no such thing as an individual theology. The best theology is a communal exercise. So reading from below means that we read together and we read from the perspective of marginality, poverty, mestizaje, exile, solidarity, as Gonzalez says. Let me finish with the words of John Mbiti. He spoke almost in a lament some years ago saying, we have eaten theology with you. We have drunk theology with you. We have dreamed theology with you. But it has been all one-sided. It has been, in a sense, your theology. We know you theologically. The question is, do you know us theologically? Would you like to know us theologically? Can you know us theologically? And how can there be true theological reciprocity and mutuality if only one side knows the other fairly well? while the other side either does not know or does not want to know the first side. You have become a major subconscious part of our theologizing, and we are privileged to be so involved in you through the fellowship we share in Christ. When will you make us part of your subconscious process of theologizing? And if I may contextualize at least one of his questions, would you like to know us hermeneutically? These are the questions that we are asking here. Thank you.